All right, intellectual property law. Um, I can recall when I first went to work for a law firm out of law school and we had a retreat for the first year associates and the first speaker we had was somebody from the intellectual property department at our law firm. And I remember thinking, I please let me do anything besides sit here and listen to intellectual property stuff. But actually ended up being a lot more interesting than I thought it was going to be. Um, it just doesn't, the name necessarily doesn't set off a whole lot of excitement. But uh, I do think it's an area where you'll identify with some of the real world application. We're talking about things that acquire legal protection in the names, slogans, packaging, trademarks, logos, sounds, writings, recordings, choreo choreographed performances, things that are a result of a creative process that are unique to the creator in such a way that we would want to give them protection from other people stealing it or copying it. So that's basically, that's the whole idea of intellectual property. The more distinctive a logo is, a slogan is, the more individual a composition is, the more likely it is to gain legal protection. Okay? So, if I compose a symphony that's never been composed before, I should be entitled to be protected from people stealing my work or stealing my ideas, right? Um, if I come up with a logo for my company that is unique to my brand, I should, be, I should get some protection for that. The more general a word, a mark, a phrase, the less likely it is to get protection unless it is so associated with a certain product that it's acquired kind of a secondary meaning. And I'm going to give you some examples of that here in a second. But the general idea of intellectual property is that we should be protected from people stealing or using our ideas or our creations without our permission, or more importantly, without compensating us for using it. Really what it boils down to. So the first category of intellectual property we're going to talk about is trademarks. All right, a trademark is something distinctive. It could be a word. It could be a symbol. It could be a sound. It could be a design that identifies the manufacturer of a source of goods or the provider of a service. All right, if I put the Target logo up on the screen without the word Target, you all know what that is automatically. That's for Target stores. If I put up the Nike swoosh, you know what that is. If I put up the Nike slogan, just do it, that's a Nike slogan. Burger King, what's the Burger King slogan? Somebody have it your way? Is that right? I don't know. I thought I knew it, but then I called it out and I don't know. Um, finger licking good. Kentucky Fried Chicken, there's one for you. So uh, those are trademarks. I uh, mentioned sound. Law and Order could trademark the cha-ching sound or the whatever you call that sound is that they do whenever they switch scenes. You associate that immediately with Law and Order. Um, one of the wireless carriers, what is it? The do-do-do-do-do. Who's that? T-Mobile? Yeah, so that's T-Mobile. Um, those could be trademarked as well. Again, Remember the kind of the overriding principle of this is the more distinctive it is, the more unique it is, the more associated it is with that pr product, the more likely it is to gain protection. 
trademarks are registered with the Federal Trademark Office. So they have to approve or disapprove the trademark. So in order to get protection, to get granted a trademark over your sound design, phrase, whatever, they've got to approve it as unique to you. So I want to talk about um, sort of the scale of distinctiveness of trademarks and how we might see some terms that we would think of as being generic or plain or um, not having a distinct meaning, gaining that depending on how they're used. So let's start at the top of the spectrum, and these would be in a category of arbitrary and fanciful trademarks. These are the most distinctive ones you could come up with. They're usually either a made-up word, like Google, uh, or they are an ordinary word that has acquired a distinct specific meaning, like Apple, computers. That is arbitrary and fanciful. Target, Xerox, Amazon, they don't have anything to do with the product. Amazon doesn't tell you from just the name what the product is, what the business is, what the service is. It's completely arbitrary. But we, we sure as heck know now to associate Amazon with the online retailer where you can pretty much get anything you want. So everybody, for a second, uh, Google, everybody has their electronics. Google arbitrary trademark or fanciful trademark, F-A-N-C-I-F-U-L. All right, just tell me what, you what are y'all seeing? Examples of arbitrary or fanciful trademark. Exxon, Kodak, that's a good one. Have nothing, the name itself doesn't tell you what the product is, but you, you know. What else you got? Coach, right? Coach as in the luggage and, uh, there you go, luxury accessories. Delta has nothing to do with airplanes. Domino's has nothing to do with pizza. What else? Dove the Soap Company is a good one. Anybody else? Adidas is a good one. What did you say, Mr. Garcia? Apple. Apple's a good one. All right, so, so those are going to be um, not easily protected, but it's not going to be hard for the businesses to trademark those things. Okay? Now, I want you to appreciate the difference in, let's take Apple for a second. To trademark Apple computers is easy. Apple has nothing to do with electronics, and it's become associated with the computer giant. But if Tom's Apple Farms tries to trademark the word Apple, I'm going to get denied. Okay, I can't use, we can't use generic terms and trademark them for what they mean, for what they actually are. So whereas Apple would be, would very much gain protection as a computer name, it would not as a name for just apples. The reason for that is, if I trademark the name Apple for the actual fruit apple, then that deprives everybody else of using the word for what its meaning is. If I trademark Apple computers, I'm not, I'm not depriving anybody else of the opportunity to name their computers. They can pick something else. But you can't name an Apple something other than an Apple. All right, if we're going down the hierarchy here, arbitrary and fanciful get the most protection. The next level down is a suggestive trademark. All right, so suggestive trademarks they do have some bearing on the business or the service or the product, but it's not obvious. It requires a little bit of thought 
or some sort of perception to make the link. Uh, Greyhound, okay? Greyhound doesn't automatically tell you that that's a bus, but it gives you the image of a fast racing dog that we can associate with uh, fast transport. Netflix. Netflix doesn't tell you right off the bat what it is, but it's pretty suggestive of, well, y'all probably don't remember this, but Netflix started when you, you would order um, DVDs online and they would send them to you and you'd watch them and you'd have to send them back. That was the business model for Netflix. Um, so we were, we were ordering movies basically on the internet, Netflix. Everybody Google suggestive trademark example. And tell me what you get. What you got? Jaguar? Okay. Jaguar's a good one. Microsoft. Microsoft. Probably because of the, well, micro and then soft for software. Okay. I get that. Jaguar doesn't automatically tell you about a car, but at least suggestive of a fast, High performance vehicle. Airbus. Airbus. That's, that's the maker of the airplanes, right? Okay. Sprint. Good one. So, suggestive trademarks um, enjoy protection as well. Maybe not quite the high degree of protection that an arbitrary and fanciful trademark would enjoy, but suggestive trademarks are um, generally protected. If we're going down the list or down the hierarchy, we're getting less protection as we go. We're getting more generic and more general in the description of the words or the trademark. Um, so the next category would be descriptive. Terms that merely describe a good or service. Like if I wanted to use the word soft and I make towels, probably not going to be able to trademark the word soft. That's descriptive and it applies to a lot of different things and it would deprive others of the use of a word and its ordinary meaning. Same goes with the bottom category, which is pure generic words. Okay, I can't trademark the word car for my automobile. Just like I can't trademark the word apple for the fruit apple. These are common everyday terms that everyone has the right to use. It is possible, I'm going to go back up the ladder for a second, it is possible for a descriptive term to get trademark protection, but it has to be, uh, it has to have acquired a secondary meaning over time, such that it's association with that good or product is so strong that we all know what it is. So example of that is like um, the word charger for the Dodge charger. Okay, the, just the, the word, the regular word charger would generally be too generic for trademark protection. But over time, we understand that that Dodge charger we know what that is. We associate the, the word charger with the car. And so the, they might be able to trademark the descriptive word charger for their car. That doesn't mean they could co-opt the word charger and keep it from anybody else ever using it. There's a football team called the San Diego Chargers. There's no confusion between the football team and the Dodge car. So they both could trademark Charger for their respective um, respective goods, services, products, or whatever. So the more general, the more descriptive a, a word is, the more common the word is, the less likely it is to be protected. A word like um, Adidas, if we're going all the, all the way back up the ladder to the arbitrary category, a word like Adidas, there, there's not anything else we could use with that. It doesn't have any other meanings. So those are trademarks.
So what kind of protection does the trademark enjoy? Uh, a couple different types. <clears throat> it is protected from being infringed upon, which means other people can't steal it and use it. Infringement is just when somebody cops your trademark phrase, picture, logo, and uses it for their own. Now this can get confusing because the trademark, again, the protection is limited to protecting that particular business, right? So even though the color brown, the UPS brown, they've trademarked that color for use in the package delivery industry. That doesn't mean they own the, that particular color brown that no one else can use it. But no one else could be a, deliver, a package delivery service and use that exact color brown. I could use brown in my law office. So trademark infringement is preventing somebody else from stealing or using your exact logo or something that's pretty dang close to your logo that it causes, uh, that we would confuse. Okay, like if, um, if the Jaguar animal logo was put on a bicycle or a, a motorcycle, I'm assuming they don't make motorcycles, was put on a motorcycle, we would think, that would lead the ordinary person to think that the Jaguar automobile manufacturer is making that um, motorcycle. If I put a Jaguar logo of the, the cat running or whatever on my breakfast cereal, a lot less likely that it's confused with the Jaguar automobile manufacturer. Now, what if my what if my breakfast cereal is race cars, and the, the little pieces of my cereal are race car shaped, and I name it Jaguar? Then I've probably got a problem because now I'm creating some confusion. Okay, when you do that, when you so just outright uh, copying somebody else's logo or slogan is trademark infringement. But if you're using it in the not the exact same way, but you're, it's confusing, that's trademark dilution. D-I-L-U-T-I-O-N. You're diluting the value of the brand or the trademark. So if I make, if I make fast performance cars and I put the Jaguar logo on it, that's going to be infringement. But if I make the cereal with a race car, little sugar bits of race car, and I put something that looks similar to the Jaguar logo on my box, but not exactly the same, then that might be trademark dilution. And that's protected as well. The, the, the thing that we're protecting is that business's unique right to their brand, their name, their slogan, their slogan, their slogan, their logo, their own creative process. That's what we're trying to protect. Um, let me give you another example too that, of trademark dilution. Let's say that, um, let's say that a maker of uh, baby formula a maker I can't think of the name of a maker of baby formula Gerber is that what y'all said thank you that's it Gerber makes all right, makes that nasty baby food so um, let's say that there is a, I want to make moonshine whiskey and I call my whiskey Gerber 
Well, Gerber is kind of an arbitrary and fanciful name, right? It doesn't have any other meaning. Let's say that Dove soap product, cleanliness products, that I want to make a moonshine, a nasty moonshine called Dove. Uh, and I say that they can't, it's not trademark dilution because I'm making liquor. They make soap. That's totally not the same thing. No one is going to confuse that. Nobody's going to think that Dove makes this moonshine. They still might argue that it tarnishes their brand because it has alcohol, has a negative, might have a negative connotation, uh, and that if anybody were to sort of confuse it, that it might make them look bad by association. That might also be trademark dilution. If the association is something that's unpleasant or it does something that would tarnish somebody's reputation. I don't know if that was the greatest example, but I think you get it. Um, almost anything can be trademarked as long as it's unique enough. So think about the McDonald's M with the golden arches. All right, the letter M in and of itself can't be trademarked. That's part of the alphabet. Everybody can use the letter M. But that particular design of M, which is golden and arched in the way it is, that can be trademarked because that's a unique expression of the M. The Nike swoosh. A check mark is a common writing symbol. Okay, Nike could, could trademark something that's very common like that because it has been associated with Nike. Well, we know what that swoosh is when it comes to clothing or, or shoes. All right, so those are trademarks. Let's talk about um, trade dress. So trade dress is the image, the overall appearance of a product. That's also protected. So like the Coca-Cola glass bottle with the contours and the waves, protected. The, um, the Tiffany blue box. Okay, they can't really trademark a box. We all use boxes, but they can trademark that particular blue color box. Another business could use that color blue, but they couldn't use it in a way that is suggestive or reminiscent or copying the Tiffany blue box. It doesn't keep somebody from using that color in their logo but it does prevent them from dressing their products up in the same way that Tiffany does. So trade dress. A big consideration in trade dress, uh, because it involves appearance, is whether or not it's going to cause any confusion to the consumer. The more likely it is to cause confusion, the more likely it is going to be protected. Trade dress. Counterfeit goods are protected under federal law in a way that would be, um, it's really trademark infringement, right? If I make, or they sell those pocketbooks on the streets of New York, if I make a Gucci purse and I put the name Gucci on it, I'm just outright ripping off their trademark. That's trademark infringement. So counterfeiting is a, a sort of a subcategory of that. Um, licensing is an important concept in intellectual property because it's a way around suing people as your remedy for trademark infringement or dilution. Okay? The last thing that a business wants to do is pay lawyers to go and file a lawsuit and then have to wait out the whole litigation process over intellectual property disputes. An easier way and a, a much more beneficial way is to license it and say, I'll give you the right to use it, but you have to do what? 
pay me for it, right? Then everybody wins. You can use your mark or whatever that's similar to mine or, or uh, very, very um, reminiscent of mine, but I'm going to make some money off that. Then everybody wins. All right, next category of intellectual property we want to talk about is patents. Patents you would associate with inventors. Um, it protects the invention itself from being copied or used by other people for profit. So if I design a machine that bottles soft drinks, and it's a design and process that no one else has done before, I can get a patent on that, and that gives me the exclusive right to use it. Patents do have to be registered with the federal government, so it has to be approved. And very similar to trademarks, the more unique, the more individual, the more specific the invention is, the more likely it is to be protected. We cannot patent things that are universal, generic, already exist in nature. We can't patent breathing. We can't patent abstract ideas like happiness, joy. Those are not specific enough. Patents are protected from infringement, meaning that nobody else can use your design or invention in a way for their own. Okay? Um, in technology, this is a huge area of controversy. Well, not controversy, but conflict, because um, it gets way over my head, but <clears throat> you know the difference between the way that an Apple chip processes information versus the Samsung chip. I, I mean, I could spend the rest of my life studying that, and I would never understand it. Um, one little tweak or one little difference might make something unique enough to be protected differently than the original design, right? But that's going to be up to really smart patent lawyers and the patent office who hire people that understand technology. Apple has been, Apple and Samsung have been fighting for years over some of Apple's design patents having to do with like user interface and screens and buttons and I mean stuff that again goes way over my head. Licensing it would be another way for patent disputes to benefit both parties. Um, if I if my invention for bottling soft drinks would let's say that I Coca Cola developed it and Pepsi wants to use it, and they want to pay Coke for the right to use it, then everybody wins. Okay? If they want to use it without paying for it, then we've got problems and we'll probably have lawsuits as a result. The next one I want to talk about is copyrights. So copyrights are a little bit different than trademarks and patents in that they don't have to be registered with the government to gain protection. But copyrights protect creative expression. Literary, artistic, visual, sculpture, music compositions, poems, books, articles, Anything that's the result of a creative process 
if it's fixed in a durable medium. It's kind of the way we measure it. Then it's going to be protected from somebody else using it. And it does not have to be registered. We would spend unlimited resources and time and people if we were copyright if we had to register a copyright on everything that got created if a painter had to copyright every single painting or if a photographer had to copyright every single photograph that's just that's not really feasible so copyright protects that protection lasts for the life of the creator plus 70 more years Life of the Creator plus 70 more years. There's some different rules. I'm not testing you on the differences. There's some different rules for um, people who publish books. They, they, their copyrights last a little longer. Um, but again, I, I don't need you to necessarily know the intricacies of that. What is protected then? Reproduction of the work. If I paint a painting that becomes famous, other people cannot make prints of it or use pictures of my painting without my permission. People can't develop derivative things from it. So if I... Um, if I write a song that goes viral um, and it has to do with, I don't know, I'm going to make up something that doesn't make any sense. Um, but other people can't then take my song or my lyrics and change them in a way to where they're not exact, but they're asso still associated with my idea. That'd be protected. So, um, again, this is literary works, musical works, dramatic works like a play, a dance, sculptures, pictorial graphics, a movie is copyrighted. Somebody can't use that movie without paying me for it. Use my movie without paying me for it. Software, formulas, that kind of thing. I would all enjoy copyright protection. Now, again, just like everything else we've talked about today, the more unique, the more it's the result of creative process, the bigger, larger, more complex it is, the more likely it's going to get protection. I can't copyright a musical, one single musical note. But I might could copyright, um, well, the case we're going to read Thursday talks about when something could enjoy copyright protection. How many notes does it have to be? Is two, a two-note combination copyrightable? Probably not. Is a three-note? I don't know. We might could all think of some sounds, some three-note combinations that we all know what that means. What did we say earlier was the... Dun, 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 dun. That's, that's five notes. Those particular, that particular sequence of five notes is copyrightable. Because we, it's gained association with T-Mobile. Artists, uh, musicians, and artists get in trouble with this sometimes, and they there's all, often litigation about whether or not you've used a certain sequence of notes that somebody else has previously used. You can see where this would get real complicated, because there's a finite number of notes in the musical scale. There's an infinite number of ways we could combine them. 
The case that I've assigned you to read for Thursday involves um, the song Blurred Lines. So I'm not going to give too much of it away, but um, I think you'll, it's, it's an interesting case. So that's copyright. A fact is not copyrightable. Um, the fact that 2 plus 2 is 4 is not copyrightable. Ideas, generic ab abstract ideas are not copyrightable. The idea of happiness, the idea of joy, things like that. Anybody have any questions about any of this so far? I do want you to be familiar with something called the fair use exception in copyright. And it carves out some ways that we can use other people's works without their permission. One is educational. So I could use, um, I could assign you a Wall Street Journal article to read. I could post the article to my content module and, and that would not be copyright infringement. I am using somebody else's article, yes, but I'm using it for educational purposes. If I'm a movie critic or a book critic, I might be able to use a quote from the book or a clip from the movie as part of my review. That would not be copyright infringement. If I wanted to quote something from a historical document, I've quoted the law for y'all from the written codes of the United States and the state of Georgia. I've lifted those and I've put them in my material. That's not copyright. They're historical documents. They're public documents. I'm not using them for my own gain. Um, research would be another area where it would be okay to use somebody else's work without their permission. New, the news. If... Um, there was a dispute over the lyrics of a song and I wanted to talk about it on my podcast and I play the disputed phrase. I'm not violating copyright by doing that. I'm doing it in a way that serves a public purpose. Now, if I'm using the clip, the quote, the phrase, the note sequence, not for education, not for news, not for research, I'm using it in a way that's going to make me money, then I'm infringing on the copyright. Okay? The more I use of somebody's work, the more likely I am to be infringing on their copyright. So if I'm a movie reviewer, and I show a 10 second clip of a movie, that's probably not copyright infringement. If I show 30 minutes of a movie, that might be a different story. So the factors that a court would consider, again, there's, there is no bright line test for when somebody has infringed on it. It will always be up to the jury or the judge to decide. And they're going to look at things like, did you use it for commercial purposes? Did you make money off of it? How much did you use? How extensive was it? Was there a license available that you could have gotten? How much harm are we actually doing to the owner of the copyright? The more harm we're doing, from the, doing to them, the more likely we've infringed on it. So those would be some factors that a court would look at. That is the fair use exception. The last category of intellectual property that I want you to know is trade secrets. 
So trade secrets would be similar to patents, I think, in that they protect maybe a design, something unique to a product that the public doesn't know about. The formula of Coca-Cola, the 11 herbs and spices in Colonel Sanders' fried chicken, trade secrets, customer lists, business plans, marketing techniques maybe, um, research and development. If I spend the money and I do those and they're unique to my company, then somebody else shouldn't be able to use them without compensating me. This comes to play mostly when um, an employee leaves the company and then takes some of these trade secrets with them and uses them for their own gain at another company or their own personal gain. That would be theft of trade secrets. If a, an employee sold confidential information like a customer list or a formula or a recipe to a competitor or to somebody else, that'd be theft of trade secrets. And that would be a violation of the protection that that trade secret enjoys. Trade secrets. So let's talk for a second about what I want you to do for an assignment this week. We will not have a quiz, but you will have an assignment, and your assignment is this. It is to come to class Thursday and have an example of a... I'm going to write all this down for you, so don't, don't, you don't have to commit it to memory. I want you to come up with an example of trademark infringement or trademark dilution, a real world example. They're not hard to find. You can Google lawsuit trademark dilution and you'll come up with plenty. It could be that one of those. It could be theft of trade secrets. It could be patent infringement. It could be copyright infringement. It could be uh, trade dress infringement. Any examples of disputes about these intellectual property categories that we've talked about in class? You don't need to. You don't need to write a paper on them. I just want you to come prepared to tell us what the dispute was about, what it's an example of. Is are we talking dilution? Are we talking infringement? Is this a patent infringement? Is this copyright infringement? who the people were that were involved, and what happened. Um, just give us a short um, example on that. I think I also want you to give me an example of... Um, let me think through this. We only have 22 folks in class. So I might want you, want you to get me two examples. I'll spell it out for you today. I'll, I'll email you today and I'll post an announcement today of exactly what I want you to come to class prepared for. Um, Mr. Peter and Mr. Snyman and Ms. Delabear, your assignment is going to be a little bit different. I want you to come up with some examples of this from your home country. And I also want you to come up with some examples for us of um, the equivalent of trademark in your country. Like I want you to show us some things that are trademarked and why. Um, like the Target logo. Do you have a store in Germany, Elias, that has a logo that is arbitrary and like I, I want you to come up with some examples of those to show us that way does that make sense um or if there's a slogan like nike has just do it if you if there's a german company that has a certain slogan that uh that, that everybody in germany knows um tell us about that um you don't have to you don't have to like make any presentation or anything but um 
I, w- I, want, I want some international flavor, some examples from your home country. Um, does anybody have any questions? I think we're done a little bit early today. Um, if you came in late, raise your hand. 